Hey everybody, happy Friday to you. I hope your weekend is off to a good start. I am glad that you're here. Last Friday, I shared a lesson entitled The Eve Complex, which is a four-part series. Part one was, Did God Really Say That? Part two was, Eye Candy. Part three was, The Jealous Serpent. And I closed it out last week with part four, Was It Worth It? So if you haven't checked that series out yet, I would highly encourage you to do so in your spare time. So today is the beginning of another series entitled Growing Pains, and today's lesson has a subtitle of an axe and a butter knife. So let's go ahead and jump right in. When it comes to personal growth, we must routinely analyze our life to see if we're making progress or if we've been stuck in the same place for quite a while and we don't even realize it. God never planned for his children to ride the struggle bus all our lives, live in the past, be consumed with what other people are doing, and be in the same place emotionally, physically, spiritually, and even financially that we were a year ago. We should always be evolving, moving forward, and advancing his kingdom in the earth. It is something that he expects and he also requires of his children. But how do we get there? How do we improve our lives? How does growth happen? Of course, we have to cultivate our relationship with God, and that will always be first. Have a consistent prayer life. Do his word, and notice I didn't just say read or know it, because that means nothing without action. And there will also be other believers that God will place in our lives along the way to sharpen us. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen, the New Living Translation states, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. If we can't be lovingly corrected or challenged to change, we will never grow. Our life will never improve beyond where we are right now, as change requires confronting the behaviors, the patterns, and habits that don't serve us and contradict who we say we are. As Christians, we respond to one another as either an axe or a butter knife, and hopefully by the end of this lesson, you will be able to determine which one you are. So let me explain this analogy by digging a little deeper into the whole concept of an axe and a butter knife. A butter knife, I'm sure we have all used one, but just in case you haven't, a butter knife, hence the name, is typically used to cut butter, spread butter, you can use it to make a good peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or it also can be used on any food that is soft and doesn't require a sharp blade. The blade of the knife, of this knife, is totally dull, it's smooth, and it can't cut through much of anything. What is an axe? And I'm sure we all know what an axe is as well, and we may you know, have seen one or maybe even used one, but just in case, it's a tool that's often used for chopping wood. It has a steel blade that is attached at a right angle and also has a wooden handle. So now that we've defined a butter knife and an axe and what they're used for, I will compare them to our spiritual lives. The type of blade that we use as Christians will determine how effective we will be. So let's go ahead and talk about this butter knife first. A person who professes to live for Christ but has a butter knife mindset only wants to hear the soft things, the good things about themselves, things that don't challenge their fragile ego and correction to them feels like character assassination, like how dare you? (laughs) They avoid healthy confrontation. They're the victim of their own story. They're experts at playing this game called blame. They hear correction with an ear of offense, with ears of their past. They're prideful and end up sending away or attacking the ones that God has sent to help them. But Proverbs chapter 9 verses 8 through 9, the Amplified Version, tells us what to do when we encounter these type of people. And it states, Do not correct a scoffer who foolishly ridicules and takes no responsibility for his error, or he will hate you. Correct a wise man who learns from his error, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will become even wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase his learning. Maybe as adults, we don't like correction because as kids, we were scolded and punished in a harmful way, or we were told that we'd never be anything, we never get anything right, we're a failure. So as we get older, we hear with those same ears. We think people are putting us down or hating on us, but in reality, they're trying to help us see a version of ourselves that we haven't realized yet. 
But the most beneficial thing we can do, no matter what age we are, is to be open to God's correction. And even when it comes through people, we may be grown in years. Yes, we have our own house. We work, we pay bills, but our approach to God should always be with reverence and awe of a child. Salvation through Jesus Christ provided redemption from our sins, reconciliation with God and eternal life. But all the stuff that we were involved in prior to salvation, the way we behaved, our hangups, character flaws, they didn't automatically disappear. If we were bitter, unforgiving, full of hate, jealous, sexually immoral before accepting Christ, then that sinful lifestyle will still be a struggle as a Christian. That's why we must allow God to refine us so that we become more like him. And this process is called sanctification, which is ongoing and it never, ever ends. When it comes to an ax approach concerning our walk with God, the blade of an ax is heavy, strong, it's solid, it has the ability to do hard things. When the blade is sharp, it can perform with ease and it doesn't require a lot of elbow grease or physical exertion. An ax with a sharp blade is a powerful and efficient tool. Now, when it comes to trying to chop down a tree, if you have a butter knife Forget it. It's not happening. And even when using an ax, if the blade is dull, it will take more physical strength to get the job done and you'll end up doing double or triple the amount of work and probably even injure yourself in the process. Doing things in our own strength will wear us down. It's going to cause unnecessary suffering. We'll labor with no results. If we are wasting time toiling in areas of our lives that we should have already had victory over, That means that our blade is dull and we are long overdue for a sharpening. Ecclesiastes 10 and 10, the Amplified Bible states, If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. But wisdom to sharpen the axe helps him succeed with less effort. Hopefully by now you've identified if your approach to your walk with God is that of a butter knife, meaning you want everything to be smooth and go your way. And if so, it's not too late to change. Or you're an ax. You're willing to tackle hard things about yourself, but you need a little sharpening in certain areas like we all do. So you ready to do some sharpening? So let's think about a pencil. It can't sharpen itself. And when you're writing with one and the point gets dull, it doesn't even write the same. And if the lead breaks, you really can't use the pencil unless you sharpen it. I don't have what it takes to sharpen a pencil by myself. No matter how hard I try, I cannot sharpen one with my bare hands. I've got to have a pencil sharpener or some type of sharp blade. And we also can't become who we were created to be, independent of God and other people. Now, we definitely need God, but we also need each other too. So now let's discuss three things. How do we sharpen our lives? What does sharpening look like? And what does sharpening sound like? Now we're going to bypass what it feels like because living by our feelings is what has caused our lives to get dull in the first place. So first of all, how do we sharpen our lives so that we don't stay stuck and that we can move forward? Now, just like an ax or a pencil can't sharpen itself, we must have God and other like-minded people to help improve our lives. We start with God's word, of course, which is super sharp, it's precise, and it will never get dull. It should be our go-to for everything, but reading it and quoting it and being able to even memorize it, it means nothing if we refuse to do what it says. Hebrews 4 and 12, the ERV translation states, God's word is alive and working. It is sharper than the sharpest sword and cuts all the way into us. It cuts deep to the place where the soul and the spirit are joined. God's word cuts to the center of our joints and our bones. It judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. Now that I know how to sharpen my life through my relationship with God, his word, and other people, what does sharpening look like? It's certainly not pretty nor feel good activity. So let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. But with any sharpening process, there is friction, heat, sparks may fly. There's a grinding and tearing away of any buildup that caused it to become dull in the first place. We have to remember that our flesh is always in constant conflict with the spirit of God that lives inside of us and being sharpened irritates our flesh. It will not like being called on the carpet. So instead of taking it personal, remember the reason for the battle. 
Just like gold is purified by fire, the fire burns off the dross or the impurities from the gold. The same thing happens when we sharpen each other. It is part of the sanctification process that I discussed a few moments ago. We've discussed how we sharpen our lives, what sharpening looks like, and now that we have this friction, the sparks are flying, what does being sharpened sound like? When living from our flesh, our physical ears don't want to hear anything that challenges our way of doing things. Even if it's coming from God, our pastor, our parents, our trusted friends or mentors, we take correction as an attack from the devil. But think about it. Will the enemy to your greatness ever confront you about something that would make you better or more like Christ? Absolutely not. We all have blind spots. I have them. Things that we're doing that are totally wrong and maybe we're unaware Or maybe we've even gotten comfortable and we don't want to change. If we only want a yes man around us, someone that will agree with everything we do, tell us how lovely we are, tiptoe around our issues, ignore the elephant in the room, then they are no benefit to you, nor are you to them. I was talking with a very good friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, and we were just sharing some of the areas of our lives that God has shown us, you know, that we need to be sharpened in. And we both agreed that we were going to correct each other as needed. And trust me, you definitely need a friend like that in your life. So don't let platforms, titles, or the number of years that you've been saved convince you that there is no personal work to be done because there is, and there always will be, but we shouldn't be struggling in the same area year after year after year. God's sharpening of my life, it required that I be open to hearing some hard truths about why my life was in the state that it was in. And although what he said was unpleasant to my ears and to my ego, his approach was full of compassion, mercy, and love. His chastisement felt like love to me and I knew he was only doing it because he had more for me and he also expected more of me. Hebrews 12 verse 6 and verse 11, the new International Version states, Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Verse 11, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We all know the difference between criticism and love. It has a different sound. Criticism sounds like someone is putting us down, saying mean and hurtful things to deflate our self-esteem, critiquing our every move, picking our life apart. That is not sharpening. That is judging. But iron that has been sharpened before knows what the process feels like, so they will be gentle and loving, even when telling you the truth. We know they're right, and we just don't want to admit it because we're adults, and we think we're grown, and we don't take too kindly to someone correcting us Even when it's done from a sincere place, we don't want any part of it. A biblical example of dull people that were hard to deal with, stiff-necked, defiant, they didn't want to listen to God or the one that he sent to lead them. Who might that have been? You guessed it, the children of Israel. God's chosen people whom he rescued from the hands of Pharaoh in Egypt He prepared a promised land for them to live in, and all they had to do was follow Moses' lead through the wilderness en route to Canaan. Everything they needed for the journey, God provided. He defeated their enemies along the way, but they rebelled. They complained. They felt like going back to bondage was better than having their flesh challenged. They kept erecting idols when things didn't go their way. These people gave God and Moses a hard time, and the journey took way longer than it should have because they refused correction. They flat out refused to change, and many of them sadly missed the promised land for this very reason. In closing, I know we're grown in age and maybe even in the number of years we've been saved, but we must always be childlike when it comes to God. We must always be teachable even when it comes through people. So let's pray to have ears to hear and not through the ears of our insecurities, our trauma, rejection, or disappointment. Let's ask God to bring people into our lives to get rid of the dullness and help sharpen us so that we can help sharpen other people too. And when he does, because he's going to, be open to receiving what they have to say. Encouraging ourselves is great, but sometimes we won't confront ourselves beyond what feels comfortable. There is more inside of us, and yes, God has more for us, 
but it requires that we're open to having our weaknesses brought to the forefront so that we can correct them. So my advice to all of us is to let the grinding, the tearing, the friction, the sharpening, let it happen. Welcome it. Embrace it. See it as a gift wrapped in a beautiful bow from your Heavenly Father who truly loves you. If we keep taking the easy route by sparing our feelings, we will never see the best version of ourselves and we will only be a mere fraction of who God intended for us to be. Yes, God really does have an amazing plan for you, but part of that plan is being open to his correction, however he decides to send it. So ask God to place some iron in your path and let the sparks fly. You're going to be so much better for it. Thank me later. Thank you so much for hanging with me today. I appreciate you as always. Please consider subscribing while you're here, like this video. It is my goal to build a community of women who encourage and celebrate each other as we become everything that God had in mind. Any takeaways from today's lesson, please leave me a comment. I will reply. I'll leave my website, podcast, and social media platform information in the description of this video. And please join me next Friday for part two of the Growing Pain series with a lesson entitled Similac or Steak. Are we failing to thrive as Christians because of our spiritual diet? Join me next Friday and let's unpack this lesson. In the meantime, remember that you matter. In Christ, you are enough. You are never alone. And most importantly, you are eternally and unconditionally loved. Until next time, take care. Thank you.